Good afternoon. My name is Alex Reich, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and to the third event of our new monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. Our conversation today will be recorded and made available on this webpage tomorrow. We won't be taking questions from the audience, but we would appreciate your feedback and your ideas for future conversations, which I invite you to share after the event in the survey linked just above this video. Above, you'll also find links to register for two upcoming virtual events. One is our May 20th Climate Conversation on Solar Geoengineering, moderated by Frank Sesno and featuring National Academy of Sciences President Marsha McNutt and Chris Field, the chair of last month's National Academies report on solar geoengineering. The other event is the first ever Nobel Prize Summit, which the National Academy of Sciences is organizing on April 26th to 28th. The Nobel Summit focuses on three key areas critical to the future of humanity, fighting climate change and biodiversity loss, reducing inequality, and advancing technological innovation. If you don't see a link there, you can refresh the page or do a search for Nobel Prize Summit. But today, on what in any other year would be tax day in the US, we're thinking about climate change in the context of costs and benefits. Specifically, we're gonna have a conversation about the social cost of carbon, its importance for addressing climate change and considerations for how it can advance equitable and economically sound policies. And as recent events so clearly demonstrate, our country has a long way to go on many fronts in the journey toward equity and justice. And we hope today's conversation can be part of a broader discussion about how we move towards action on the key areas critical to our humanity, both in the present and the future. We're honored to be joined by Justin Warland, a Washington DC based senior correspondent for time covering climate change and the intersection of policy, politics and society. Justin will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Justin, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here moderating uh, this, this conversation. Um, I'm going to break it up into two parts. Uh, the first part is sort of the grounding so that everybody can uh, have a, a, an understanding of what we're talking about, the social cost of carbon and uh, you know, some of the related uh, questions related to that. And the second part will dive into some of the uh, questions that are surrounding the social cost of carbon today. I've called it uh, social cost of carbon in 2021. So some of the surrounding concerns, how do we think about it in the context of questions about uh, the current science, of questions about equity uh, and, and justice and other things that have, uh, that have dominated the conversation as of late. Um, I will note that neither of our uh, conversationalists are, uh, are experts on environmental justice, uh, but nonetheless, I hope it will be an insightful uh, conversation um, and with that, I'd like to introduce them. Uh, first, we have Richard Newell, who's the president and CEO of Resources for the Future, uh, which is an independent nonprofit research institution that looks at energy, environment, uh, and natural resources uh, and looks at the economics uh, behind that. Uh, he was the chair of the 2017 National Academies report, valuing climate damages, updating estimation of the social cost of carbon dioxide. Uh, which I believe uh, you can see uh, at a link above the video. Uh, and we have Rach Rachel Cletus, who is the policy director with the Climate and Energy Program at the University, excuse me, Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, as she leads, leads the program's efforts to design effective and equitable uh, climate policy. Um, thank you to both of you for joining. Um, thank you, Justin. Thank, just, just to start, I think uh, it'd be great to hear a bit uh, from each of you about how you got involved in this space. Um, we can start with Richard. Oh, sure. Th uh, well, thanks. It's, it's really a, pl a pleasure to be in this conversation. You know, I'm, a, I'm an economist and I've been working on issues uh, related to climate policy for about three decades now. So pinpointing exactly when I uh, first got engaged in issues specifically around the social cost of carbon, I think probably goes back to the 1990s when uh, Bill Nordhaus uh, really wrote some of his early articles around um, thinking about the climate problem from an economic perspective. It's it's what won him the Nobel Prize uh, just uh, more recently. So I've also been uh, working on issues like studying long-term discounting. How do we think about valuing 
uh, impacts on society that occur in the not only the near but the distant future. Uh, so that's another element that's brought me to this issue. And then the first part of the Obama administration, I was at the Department of Energy. Uh, and in that capacity, I was involved in what's called the Interagency Working Group on the Social Cost of Carbon, which we'll probably come to later. Um, and then finally, um, I, as you alluded to, I was engaged in the National Academy of Sciences study on social cost of carbon. And then at RFF, uh, since I've been at Resources to the Future the last few years, we've been uh, leading an initiative around uh, implementing the recommendations of the National Academy. So I've been uh, uh, kind of early days in the 1990s, but I've been working pretty consistently around these issues for a while now, I guess. Right. Great. Well, uh, Rachel? Uh, Justin, that's great to be here, and thank you so much to the NAS for setting up this panel. Um, my work at the Union of Concerned Scientists is, is very interdisciplinary in nature. Uh, I happen to be an economist by training. Justin, your misfortune to be your fortune to be here with two economists <laughs> today. But uh, I work with a team of climate scientists and other experts uh, on this issue of climate change from this very interdisciplinary perspective. And um, I, uh, what I remember about first thinking about these issues is back in grad school, uh, it was around the time of the 1992 Rio Summit, and I was just starting grad school, and I was shocked that climate change wasn't front and center uh, in my training as an economist in graduate school. It was only after leaving and joining the nonprofit sector that I really started to find my feet uh, working with others in other disciplines. And it's been, for me, a journey of coming back uh, to this work in different ways and really looking at how the economics profession has really grown. Richard has been a big part of that, really broadening the perspective and bringing in this kind of interdisciplinary uh, effort to think about what is one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces uh, today. In my, in my work, uh, some of the things we look at are, for example, the impacts of sea level rise and extreme heat uh, in the United States. And we're looking out within fairly near term time horizons uh, at some very significant costs that are coming our way. And just the reality that climate costs are all around us right now. We're watching these devastating hurricane seasons, extreme heat waves. Last year, the US had $22 billion plus extreme weather and climate related events here in the US. And that doesn't even take into account what's happening globally around um, flooding and storms and heat waves. So I, this is sort of the broad perspective in terms of the social cost of carbon. I remember being uh, in 2009, the, the first public meeting around this issue was held at a hotel in DC. And I remember being in some basement conference room uh, uh, with my colleague who's a climate scientist, just really excited for this new frontier of uh, research uh, and, and the opportunity that it could bring to improve our climate policies. Well, great. Well, that's, that's interesting to hear uh, that background. Rachel, I wonder if you could just introduce us to, or for those in the audience who, you know, we want to make, make sure this conversation is accessible, introduce us to the concept of a social cost uh, and, and specifically, you know, what is the social cost of carbon? Yeah, so at its core, the social cost of carbon is a pretty simple concept. The idea is that we know that carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels and from tropical deforestation are causing climate change. And uh, the other thing that we know is that uh, these emissions are coming from activities, production and consumption activities, where the people who are producing the emissions are not bearing the full costs of their actions. Those costs, those costs that come in the form of these climate impacts we were talking about are uh, spread out uh, to society at large. And that means in the terminology of economists, we have an externality, we have a market failure here where the individual decisions are not reflecting the full social costs. And ultimately that means we're getting more common emissions than is, is good for society at large. So that's the concept kind of in a nutshell, uh, and the social cost of carbon essentially is, uh, is an economic metric that's trying to set uh, basically a monetized cost per additional ton of uh, carbon dioxide that's emitted into the atmosphere. And in those costs, what we're trying to capture is all of these costs, these uh, costs to society at large. And that's where it really needs to meld, starting with climate models that are looking at how emissions get translated into cumulative emissions in the atmosphere, drive temperature changes. Those temperature changes are driving different kinds of climate risks. 
um, how those risks are affecting society in different ways then drives the costs. And we know that we can't really monetize everything, so we're capturing a snapshot of what those costs are. Uh, but that's what the social cost of carbon is trying to do. Uh, now, of course, we'll have a further conversation about appropriate and inappropriate uh, ways to use it, but uh, just very simply, that's what it's trying to do. Right. Right. Well, well, Richard, maybe could you just provide us with a little bit of, of histories uh, on the social cost of carbon uh, leading us up, you know, not inclusive of the Biden administration, but, you know, up to 2020, um, you know, specifically, I'd like to hear about its role in policymaking, the report that you chaired that we talked a bit about earlier, and then how it was thought about in the both Obama and Trump administrations. Yeah, sure. So the uh, the concept of the social cost of carbon goes back, you know, a, a long time. Um, and I would say that it was really Bill Nordhaus in the 1990s that uh, brought a lot of attention to bringing an economic lens to the understanding of climate change and also to potential solutions to climate change. Um, I think, though, when most people think about the social cost of carbon, uh, in particular this conversation, it's in the context of federal policymaking. Uh, so in that context, you really should first go back to the Reagan administration, and I will make this quick, I promise. Um, so every, every administration since the Reagan administration has had guidelines uh, in the form of executive orders that require executive branch agencies to quantitatively assess, you know, to measure um, quantitatively with numbers, the benefits and costs of major regulations they propose. Okay, so that's the impetus for why the federal government requires uh, the monetization of a social cost of carbon. So now, fast forward. So before 2008, the value uh, in quantitative economic terms of reducing the damages from climate change was not included in this kind of analysis called regulatory impact analysis. It was, uh, the implication of that is that it was assigned a value of zero, okay? But then in 2008, which is, this is now near the end of the Bush administration, um, a court looked at an automobile fuel economy standard, uh, a regulatory analysis for that, and said in so many words, you know, the damages from climate change are subject to a lot of uncertainty. We understand that, but surely it's not exactly zero. Okay. And so from that point on, since 2008 on, the federal government has been required to quantify in, you know, mon monetized terms, the damages from climate change and include that in its policy decisions for new regulations. So this is, so that's the end of 2008 is when it started being put into the regulatory process. So soon after that, the Obama administration came into office. Uh, they established uh, what has been called an interagency working group. So this is an all of government uh, working group involves Council of Ec Economic Advisors, EPA, Department of Energy, and so on. And they asked the interagency working group to look in depth at this issue of the social cost of carbon and deploy the best available science to establish consistent values for the social cost of carbon that could be used across the whole of federal government for all the different agencies. So there would be consistency in how we're valuing uh, greenhouse gas reductions. So they did that. And in 2010, uh, they put out their, uh, their estimates. Um, they relied primarily on three different integrated assessment modelings, models that existed already in the scholarly community. And then over the last few, uh, next few years during the Obama administration, they did some technical updates to that. Uh, they used the social cost of carbon in, in dozens, uh, if not hundreds of different regulatory analyses. And the estimates have also been used uh, by states for policies in the electric power sector, by the Canadian government, uh, and, inform, and also informing uh, prospective uh, federal legislation for a carbon tax. Okay, so then 2015. By uh, 2015, the federal government, again, still during the Obama administration, asked the national academies uh, to conduct a consensus study to offer recommendations for how the methods underpinning the social cost of carbon could be improved over time. At the time, the interagency working group initially did its work. It made use of the best available uh, evidence uh, in the scientific community, but with a recognition of the evolving science of climate change, increased attention to the issue, um, there was a sense that, you know, we could do better over time. And so I co-chaired that, that study uh, with Maureen Cropper, and we issued a report in early 2017. So something else happened in early 2017. Early 2017, uh, the Trump administration came into office and they took some very early on some very specific actions related to the social cost of carbon as they did with a number of other different environmentally related uh, you know, regulatory approaches. Um, one is that they, they disbanded the interagency working group. They said that the technical support documents underpinning the social cost of carbon no longer reflected government policy and then uh, later on that year in October 2017, they substantially reduced the estimates that had been used. Uh, so, you know, the Central Valley and the Obama administration for social cost of carbon was around $45 per ton. And then the Trump administration reduced it to about $1 to $6 per ton. 
That was by two simple adjustments, uh, simple but very uh, impactful adjustments. One was by using a higher discount rate, and um, then the other was by focusing narrowly on the direct, direct impacts of climate on the United States, uh, rather than estimates of the global impacts of climate change. So I'll leave it on there. You know, the the you know from then until uh, 2020. Um, uh, things have been pretty consistent in the way the social cost of carbon has been done in the federal government. Well, that was a great, uh, you condensed a lot of information in there, uh, valuable information. Um, Rachel, I just want to pick up on uh, a point in there and just to ask you to talk a bit about uh, how the social cost of carbon thinks about health impacts, air pollution, uh, effects on ecosystems, et cetera, things that are uh, beyond climate impacts. Yeah, so as Richard mentioned, uh, the underlying models, they're called integrated assessment models, and they're connecting climate systems and climate science with uh, monetizing these costs. And they're relying on existing literature. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, because if there isn't research that can help quantify or even identify a certain kind of climate impact, then it's not going to be captured in the social cost of carbon. That's why this needs to be a continually updated and improved estimate as our understanding of the science and economics improves. When we think about the current social cost of carbon, it is trying to capture damages across major economic sectors. I mentioned sea level rise, for example. There is now uh, some uh, extensive literature, including research that UCS has done on the impacts of sea level rise on coastal flooding and coastal property, uh, property values. As flooding worsens, uh, we have more and more homes at risk from this flooding. Our research has found uh, that by the end of the century, about a trillion dollars worth of real estate in the coastal U.S. alone is at risk. Uh, so that's the kind of cost that you would be able to capture, infrastructure damages. Uh, the public health costs, we're able to capture some of them. We know that extreme heat, for example, has profound impacts on uh, human health, on uh, labor productivity, etc., but there are big pieces of this that putting a number on is very difficult and, and in some cases inappropriate. Some of the ecosystem costs that we still uh, don't have a clear handle on is ocean acidification, for example. So in addition to the temperature changes, climate change is also driving ocean acidification. Um, and that is affecting marine life and marine ecosystems and ultimately livelihoods of people who depend on those ecosystems. So we know that there are gaps. The other big gap I would mention is that research has tended to concentrate on uh, the relatively rich countries. You know, in Europe and the US, we have extensive literature, but we know some of the really grave impacts are occurring in places uh, in the developing world. And we still don't have good global damage estimates for many of those kinds of impacts. Nevertheless, uh, it's really important to do this exercise because otherwise, as Richard said, the default is we're putting a zero number on uh, these carbon emissions. Right. Well, I, I, Richard, I want to come back to you. And we're, I think, nearing the end of our sort of opening segment to try to get the background here. And, and one thing that you talked about, uh, which is so crucial, is, is the discount rate. Uh, so just, you know, again, for the, anyone in the audience who's unfamiliar, could you explain what is a discount rate? Uh, and, you know, how does that influence uh, the number that comes out of the social cost of carbon? Yeah, really good question. Very important question. So what the discount rate does is it is a factor, a multiplier that allows us to add up uh, the and sum up the damages from climate change over time, right? So if we emit a ton of carbon dioxide emissions or some other greenhouse gas this year, that actually persists in the atmosphere for hundreds of years, okay? And so the damages from that ton emitted now is going to have implications for a long time into the future. It's going to have damages in each of those future years going out to, you know, hundreds of years, okay? So then if we want to um, add that up so that we can understand the benefits of taking an action now, but has but ha that has consequences over hundreds of years, uh, the discount rate is what multiplies onto the damages in each year to help us add that up. Um, it's basically another kind of a price. It's a multiplier that allows us to aggregate. Now, you might say, well, why don't we just assume they're all the same? Like, why why don't we you know, treat the damage in the year 2100 the same as the damage uh, today. And there, there's really two reasons for that. One is that 
uh, we know from observing human behavior and introspection that people care more about impacts that happen now or in the near term than they do decades from now or centuries from now. That doesn't mean that the, the future is not important. It's just not as important as near term impacts. So that it's, it's basically it's kind of a fundamental sense of like impatience that things that happen in the near term matter more than things that happen in the long term. So that's one thing. The second thing is... Um, increasing income over time, right? So the thing that we're adding up here is dollars. It's, it's measured in dollars. And the value of a dollar to people depends upon their income level. It depends on their wealth. And so if I'm a wealthy person, the value of an incremental dollar is less to me than if I'm relatively poorer, okay? And so how the size of the economy, how income changes and grows, tends to grow over time, is another reason why we would tend to put less weight on a dollar of impact in the future than today. And so for those two key reasons is why we uh, place a somewhat lower value on future impacts. doesn't mean there's no value. It means it's lower in this present value. Um, and, th and then uh, finally, I'll say, but then that, do that doesn't answer the question, so we'll, what discount rate do we use? Um, so, you know, what I've laid out is the conceptual underpinnings of why we do it. Um, really important that what rate we use, is it 3%, is it 2%, is, is it some other number? Because the consequences for the social cost of carbon are very significant. I just, I, I want to move to the next section um, with some of this interesting material, but just to follow up, you know, can you just explain what the difference between 2% and 3% means, not necessarily in the outcome, but just what, what does that mean practically? Uh, either of you can, I'd be happy to have explained. Yeah, that. Justin, so, so Richard has laid out very well the, the impact of the idea behind discount rates. And obviously using a higher discount rate means that you're essentially putting a lower value on those future damages than if you uh, used a lower discount rate. I do want to mention in the context of climate change, there's some really profound implications of the discount rate you choose. So a lot of traditional economic theory is built on, on you know, fungible items where you can imagine, you know, you have a little more here, you have a little more there as time goes by. But we're talking about the kind of uh, risk to ecosystems, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, frankly, the livability of uh, the climate in many parts of the world that is uh, less easily distilled into that kind of a commodity that we can trade across timeframes. And the kinds of changes and the rate at which we're changing our climate means that we're leaving future generations already much worse off. Uh, you know, even now at just a little over a degree Celsius increase in temperature, we're seeing some impacts that are really devastating. So it is important to think for a moment here about not just climate as a commodity and not just uh, the techno-economic aspects of what it takes to address climate change, but that this is a deeply moral problem. It is about the kind of future we're going to leave our children and grandchildren. And so I think there are obviously limits to what we can capture in the models and in the, the number the, so, that the social cost of carbon is. Uh, it is a very useful metric. And yet, you know, we should always have the bounds of, you know, recognizing with some humility where how far economic frames can take us and where we need to bring in uh, broader frames to think about these deep moral and philosophical questions about the kind of climate we want to leave future generations. Right. Just, I'll just qu very, I'll quickly add um, one, like a very specific answer to your question then and build slightly on what Rachel said. You know, the difference in, in kind of the end estimate from using a 2% rate versus a 3% rate, that may sound like a, both really small numbers, but if you use a 3% rate and, you know, hold all the other elements of the analysis uh, the same, you end up with what is currently used as a central value, which is $51 per ton of carbon dioxide. If I instead like did everything else the same, but just changed the discount rate to 2%, it would be $125 per ton, okay? So it more than doubles the value placed on reducing greenhouse gas emissions by that very small change in that number. And it has to do basically with the power of compound interest is the simplest way to think about it. The only thing I'll add to what Rachel said, which was absolutely correct, is that this is why we also should look not just at the social cost of carbon, which is a present value, it's a single metric that adds all this up. We should also look at the damages at points in time into the future, the undiscounted damages, because particularly when you're dealing with intergenerational impacts that last literally centuries, uh, we should be understanding not just the present value of that, uh, but the impacts on future generations. And, and quantitative analysis can help us there though. Um, Great. 
Well, this, this is, I think, a, a great a great background to, to pivot into the second part of this discussion. Um, uh, we, you know, heard about the history, uh, you know, uh, dating back to the origin of cost benefit analysis, uh, and uh, as well as some of the challenges. So I, I think we're in great shape to talk about social cost of carbon in 2021. Um, you know, particularly as environmental justice and equity have risen on the agenda, and as also as the science uh, has evolved. And so just to sort of, again, set the stage a little bit about 2021, Rachel, I don't know, uh, maybe you could start us off just talking a little bit about the science uh, to set that stage. Yeah, so one thing that's very clear is uh, since uh, the Obama era interagency process first kicked off, we have seen some really uh, sobering signs, both from the National Climate Assessment, uh, the U.S. Federal Agency's National Climate Assessment, that uh, the most recent one of which came out in 2018, as well as from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, most recent report, the 1.5C report that uh, talked about impacts uh, that uh, would occur globally at 1.5C. And in, in, both, in all cases, what we're starting to see, uh, even for scientists who've studied these issues for decades, it's been startling to see how, how we're coming up uh, so quickly into this, this, this uh, really unprecedented type of climate change already unfolding around us. So that's one very important piece. The science is sobering. There's also much more detail. There's much more spatial detail and on the environmental justice front, uh, just as in many other aspects of uh, the crises we see, uh, including the COVID-19 crisis and the economic crisis uh, currently uh, being experienced, the climate crisis too is falling disproportionately on communities of color and low-income communities uh, here in the U.S. And, and communities that live on the edge of poverty around the world. Uh, and that is uh, because of systemic racism, systemic inequities that are built into our society. And climate is just the latest risk that's coming on top of all that, exacerbating and being exacerbated by those inequities. And so when you think about something like the social cost of carbon, it's a number. It, it is a number that has a lot built into it, but it's still ultimately a number. And it's not uh, going to be truly representative of how uh, individual communities are experiencing these disproportionate impacts. It is a useful tool to think about societal decisions, but then we also have to really think about uh, policies that are truly just, which would target and prioritize uh, communities that are being exposed to these disproportionate harms. So we've seen the Biden administration come in and, and hit the ground running from the beginning. So they've, uh, as I think Richard mentioned in his opening remarks, they've uh, re-upped uh, this interagency process. They've set an interim social cost of carbon that reverts to the Obama era one with uh, an adjustment for inflation. So we're at $51 uh, metric ton of carbon at 3% discount rate is kind of the approximate right now. They're going through a process to update the entire uh, uh, science and economics underlying uh, the estimate. Um, and by January, 2022, we expect to see an updated number that will continually be updated on a regular basis, hopefully. Um, what, we, what we do need to understand, though, is the, the moment we're in right now with the gravity of the climate crisis, we're not talking about incremental changing of our energy system and our emissions. We're talking about transformative change. We're talking about things like getting to net zero emissions by mid-century, if not before deep cuts in emissions in the near term, at least 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, and how we do it is super important. We can't just be cutting uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We have to be cutting uh, the, the cumulative burden of air, water, soil pollutants that are falling disproportionately on environmental justice communities. We need to be addressing issues of just trying uh, for coal communities and uh, coal workers as we make this thing energy. So in this moment, the transformative change we're talking about can't be captured by any single policy or metric. That doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, what it does mean is that it has to be accompanied by very deliberate efforts uh, to center justice and equity. And one thing that the Biden administration has said very clearly is uh, they intend to 
uh, implement what they're calling the Justice 40 initiative, at least 40% of the benefits of investments flowing to environmental justice communities uh, from all of our policies, including climate policies. So that's the kind of, you know, there's a broader frame here around what the moment calls for, and the moment is calling for really transformative, just and equitable change. Uh, the social cost of carbon is an important tool in our toolbox for sure. Uh, and I think improvements in it are very, uh, are key in, in this moment. It's so exciting to have an administration that's actually gonna center science in how it approaches these issues. Well, a, that sets the stage very well for this part of the discussion. Um, well, Richard, I wanna, I wanna come to you. Uh, you know, the interagency working group has called to look at a lot of these questions about intergenerational justice, environmental justice, uh, and to evaluate how the social cost of carbon might be adapted to deal with those. Is that workable? What are the modifications that could uh, help with those questions? Yeah, I think that it's, uh, you know, R Rachel made a, a very good point, um, which is that the social cost of carbon and other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxides, it's a very important metric. Um, and it's an aggregate metric, meaning really what it's capturing is in, in a small set of numbers impacts globally, okay? So very important to, to have that perspective because um, climate is a global problem and the impacts are pervasive on the planet. The thing is, um, we also know that local impacts matter a lot. Um, and the more local you go, the more that the things you're measuring and the things you're paying attention to are affecting specific communities. And so we need to couple aggregate metrics like the social cost of carbon with much more specific metrics and analysis and policies that address um, impacts on particular communities. And the Justice 40 initiative is, is a great example of the increased attention to that. And that's really building on um, policies like was passed in the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which had a similar stipulation that 40% of the benefits from the actions taken under that act should go to disadvantaged communities. So this raises, uh, this raises not just an important policy challenge, but it raises actually a, a scientific quantity, uh, an analytical challenge, which is our ability to measure and identify um, in a clear way, the communities that we're directing attention to. You know, so how do we define disadvantaged communities? How do we measure that so that we're sure that the benefits and the uh, actions that we're taking are actually targeted in the right place? So that's one thing, Those, that's a quantitative uh, a need there. And the other is, when we do take actions, how do we know who is benefiting from those actions, right? Uh, and not just at a global or a national scale, but at a local scale. So that requires detailed, granular, geographically granular analysis that understands the local impacts of different actions on different, and not just carbon pollution, but even more importantly, local air pollution, water pollution, and so on. That requires methodological advances. And so I think that the challenge to the analytic community, and this is, this is the kind of biological community, it's the air quality modeling community, it's, it's not even primarily, I would say, the economic community. Uh, we need the tools to do that. Um, and we need to design policies that, uh, you know, have the, the measured impacts that, that we want. To, oh, sorry, go ahead if you're no, I was, yeah, so I'll, I'll just quickly wrap up, which, so I think this is, uh, is, is a much broader challenge than the social cost of carbon. I'll, I'll just finish up by saying there has been, the good news on the social cost of carbon is there has been an ability to get more specific in terms of climate impacts. You know, many of the models that have been designed to analyze climate change have been what are called like global circulation models. They, they take a, a kind of a planetary scale, but they've gotten increasingly good at identifying local impacts. And so we need to downscale um, our understanding of climate impacts to a more local level and efforts like the Climate Impacts Lab, uh, which has uh, worked as, as part of our efforts to uh, you know, implement the NAS recommendations has been effective in that. But it's not just climate impacts, it's also air quality impacts and other local impacts. Yeah, just, just briefly to build on that, you know, the social cost of carbon is going after a very specific set of costs related to uh, the heat trapping emissions, uh, CO2, methane, et cetera. We know that when we burn fossil fuels, uh, we have all these other uh, very harmful pollutants. We're talking about particulate matter, NOx, SOx, mercury, et cetera. And uh, the data show that there is a disproportionate exposure to a range of these pollutants in low-income communities and communities of color. And that's why EJ experts, I'm not one, but that's why EJ experts have been calling for very specific targeted policies, not a trickle down kind of approach where 
you deal with climate here and maybe you'll deal with co-pollutants as a result. But one that really centers these uh, public health uh, challenges that their communities have been facing. And uh, the one piece, of the insight that there too is the cumulative burden of these pollutants. So communities that are seeing burdens from multiple pollutants and that is important from a climate perspective as well, even in the social cost of carbon frame, what we're running into is compound risks. It's not just that a climate risk and then you estimate its impact. The climate risk is coming uh, like an intensified hurricane coming during COVID-19. So everything is colliding in time and space. Last year, we saw people having to evacuate uh, from the Gulf Coast and other parts of the country in, even during this pandemic. We're seeing climate risks themselves uh, collide with air pollution risks. When you think about extreme heat and ozone pollution, for example, uh, or vector-borne diseases. Uh, so it is no longer enough to just look at these risks as unique and siloed. Uh, they're really uh, cascading and compounding in ways that are magnifying the risk uh, to people. So I just, I just want to uh, follow up briefly and just ask, it, it seems like the answer, I mean, you know, given that the, the task uh, that the interagency working group is supposed to be assessing is whether the social cost of carbon can be updated with these EJ concerns in mind, it seems like the answer might be, well, uh, the social cost of carbon is important, but we have to be thinking about other policies. And, and it seems like the answer is, is perhaps uh, no to, to that question. I, I, I just want to make sure, I want to give one more chance to, to sort of just uh, pull that out a little more. Well, what I would say is that it, that it is not an adequate metric to be thinking about dealing with the challenges of these longstanding environmental injustice challenges through this one metric. But absolutely improvements of this metric are important because we have not had enough attention on uh, environmental justice uh, in our country at all. And so all of the tools need to be brought to bear. Uh, SCC cannot, the social cost of carbon cannot carry this on its own, but if we can have some spatially disaggregated metrics uh, that help us understand how uh, at a more localized level, just like the climate science itself is getting more spatially disaggregated, we need to try to understand, you know, what is happening in very specific places, even if the ult it doesn't affect the ultimate social cost of carbon number, which is a much more aggregate metric, it does help us when we do more research and understand uh, this local disaggregation. The other piece I would just say is that if to the extent that uh, the research as it goes forward uh, really does try to explore these issues of thresholds of really uh, uh, of, uh, you know, tipping points and feedback loops that we just do not want to cross. I think it also tells us uh, it's not enough to work on the margins. We really have to be driving down emissions as quickly as possible everywhere that we can. And I would say that the other final piece is the process so far has been a very academic elite process. And that's just, you know, the reality. It's It's been... Um, you know, the whole process of developing it and uh, coming up with the estimate has not been a very open and transparent one, has not involved a lot of engagement with communities to bring in those perspectives. And so I think that at the very least, as for the updates are made, it's really important to bring more people into the conversation. Uh, and that itself can help improve how we use it when we don't use it. Uh, what else is getting lost uh, as as we develop these estimates? Um, and I think there's a there's 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 a lot of intention to go that route, and and I think it'll be great to see that happen very quickly. Just I'll, I'll just I'll just add to what Rachel's already said that um, it, it is possible to do a uh, uh, additional work to get more granular about climate impacts on particular communities and then aggregate that into a social cost of carbon. So that, that is feasible, but it is not easy. Uh, it has data requirements and it's not just about the economics, it's about downscaling climate itself, which is a major scientific challenge. So I don't wanna say there isn't work to be done there and additional thinking, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. We need, we're at a stage I would say with kind of agenda setting to be able to do that. Um, I think the more immediate thing, and which I also uh, sense is, kind of more immediately important to these communities is things like local air pollution. Um, it's more, it's very immediate consequences of things that 
pollutants that are reduced along with CO2 emissions, right? And so if you looked at things like the Clean Power Plan that was proposed in the Obama administration, about half of the benef measured benefits from that were from climate benefits, and about half were from local air pollution benefits, you know, reducing fine particulate matter. And I think that there's more immediate work that can be done uh, because we already have the models and the, and the data to kind of pay attention to the local impacts of those local air pollutants and other local pollution. So I would say that that's a more immediate place uh, to, to focus our attention and to understand the implications of policy decisions for global climate and for local environmental impacts. I think it's a more immediate thing that's feasible. Right. Um, well, let's let's dive into uh, a little a discussion about the discount rate, uh, which we sort of laid the ground for earlier. Um, and I guess my question, my, my my sort of biggest question is, how does a policymaker even begin to to set it? I mean, given the the, the value judgment, when you think about you know the value of uh, you know intergenerational uh, justice, how how does a policymaker think about that? Um, and I'm I'm happy with either of you to start, but. I can go ahead. I, I, I think about uh, the issue of discounting a lot. Um, so the, the, the basic approach in benefit cost analysis is to ground it in empirical evidence. Okay. And so uh, is to look to the world we live in to get evidence and measure um, different attributes of benefits costs and how we discount them. And so the regulatory guidance that, is that has been enforced for quite a while now, since about 2003, and is still in force, um, looks to two different kinds of discount rates, and they're 3% and 7%. So the, the one that makes sense to focus on for, um, for climate change and for social cost of carbon is the 3% number, which, as I alluded to earlier, is really measuring how people value consumption, how society values consumption over time. OK, and so what the what the approach is, is to look to observed behavior in society about how society and how individuals make trade offs over time. And so the three percent number, which was uh, developed back in 2003, was based on looking at low risk, long term government bonds. OK, which around that, you know, historically around that time and before that was about three percent per year. Um, now, if one was to kind of fast forward, if one was to do a similar exercise today and the Council of Economic Advisors in 2017 did some thinking along those lines and that has you know, continued in the academic community, the number would be lower. Um, if you look at observed markets for how society, how investors, how consumers are making trade-offs over time, it's a significantly lower number. It's no longer 3%, it's lower than that. And also, if you talk to macroeconomic forecasters and others who focus on things like interest rates, you know, what is it likely to be for the foreseeable future? It's lower than 3%. And so it's an empirically grounded approach that has been used for U.S. policy. It's not kind of, it's not that somebody kind of makes up a, a, a number divorced from uh, the rest of the reality we live in. Um, so I, I expect that, that that empirically based approach uh, to continue to under to underpin benefit cost analysis. I mean, it's it's the major value of benefit cost analysis, which is like we're measuring things that we can observe. Um, it's about facts, and so um, yeah, I'll I'll leave it at that. And maybe just to add a little bit to that. So I I did speak to sort of the broader frame around the discount rate. Um, it's been interesting, you know, when we think about what it'll take to tackle a climate crisis. A lot of times the conversation turns to a deep uh, transformation in our energy system. Uh, so in the power sector, for example, really ramping up government resources of power and uh, building the kind of transmission that'll help integrate that uh, higher levels of renewables, et cetera. So uh, people have talked about using the social cost of carbon in those settings. Uh, what would that mean? Well, we're talking about long-lived infrastructure that we need to really shift to low carbon uh, kinds of infrastructure. And uh, we need to be thinking about really putting value on the carbon attributes of our energy system, not just the electricity delivery attributes and the reliability, the affordability, et cetera, but the carbon attributes. So adding this layer in should ideally uh, inform decisions that will have us switch to more low carbon electricity. And that's one way, uh, even if we don't get the exact discount rate right, if we put enough of a value on carbon free electricity, we can really take the momentum that's already underway in the power sector. We're already seeing a pretty historic shift away from coal 
and kind of accelerate that momentum. So this is a case where, frankly, uh, social cost of carbon on the order of uh, 50 to to $100 could drive a huge shift. It may not even be the exact right number for all the reasons Richard and I described. That number is, is complicated to calculate. But is it a market signal that can push the system? And it could be. But let's also remember that uh, this, uh, our solutions to this climate crisis need to be broader than just shifts in market incentives because we're really talking about transformative change, really huge changes that are butting up against entrenched interests. People who are currently earning profits of uh, fossil fuels or fossil fuel-based energy system feel no reason to get out of the way uh, and, and enable this transition. So there are lots of aspects that we have to get at and just market-based incentives are not going to be enough. We have to understand that changing systems Systemic change requires uh, really intentional policies to shift power, shift uh, uh, money, uh, and really uh, shift even the the misinformation and disinformation that has been out there uh, related to climate change. Really shift the politics around uh, an issue that should not be partisan, uh, but has become so. So the social cost of carbon is a humble tool in this toolbox. It's an important one. But we need to keep our eye on the prize, the, the big picture here, and not, um, not lose sight of the fact that we're going to need to do all of these other things as well. Right. Go ahead. Sorry. No, well, I, I'll add to that that you know, the, the social cost of carbon and other metrics that measure the benefits of reducing environmental harms are ingredients in decision analysis. They're meant to help inform policy decisions. They don't themselves make policy decisions, right? You know, we, we still need to decide, you know, what would be the form of a tailpipe standard uh, for automobiles? What, you know, how do we decarbonize the power sector? Do we do that through some kind of a cap and trade system or a carbon tax or a clean electricity standard or some other policy? We still have that decision. What the social cost of carbon is helping us do is it's helping us measure the benefits and, and costs of those actions, right? But it alone doesn't tell us necessarily the, the, the type of actions to take. So, so I, I agree with that. It's, it's a very important decision tool, but it itself is not a policy. Right, right. Well, um, I think the tool in the toolbox uh, uh, phrasing makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I wanna just in the last few minutes we have here, talk a bit about some of the novel uh, applications or applications outside of the federal government. Um, and, and I guess maybe, uh, you know, seeing as we have somewhat limited time, I just invite you both to talk about uh, areas that you find uh, most relevant and interesting in that regard. I can throw out a, a couple of quick ones. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's it has been used, and I think will be important to use in you know familiar types of regulations, like uh, tailpipe standards for automobiles, like you know regulations on the power sector. But then there's some additional areas where there's already been conversation. So one is, uh, for example, federal oil and gas leasing. So we've done work at Resources to the Future to explore the notion of what if um, federal oil and gas leasing, if the royalty structure for that incorporated the social cost of greenhouse gases in that royalty structure? What would be the implications for oil and gas production in the United States? What would be the implications for government revenues being raised? What would be the implications for um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So that's a, a, a newer example that has not been done. It was talked about in the Obama administration in the context of coal leasing program, but now re relevant as we reconsider the royalty structure for oil and gas leasing. And I'll just give one other example, which is government procurement. So there's a lot of interest in uh, government procurement, particularly in the American Jobs Plan. Um, you know, the need to <clears throat> particularly move forward uh, innovative approaches to decarbonization, things like you may think of like green cement or green steel or other uh, technologies that need some demand pull innovation. How, how do you incorporate that value into government procurement decisions? And so that's another area where actually the executive order that we alluded to earlier has asked the interagency to kind of think about applications of the social cost of carbon, maybe beyond what it has been uh, used for in the past. And just very quickly to add to that, I think uh, if the Biden administration process moves forward, we're going to see a much higher number come January 2022. And it's sending a signal to the economic and financial system, the global economic and financial system, that they, this is a risk that needs to be fundamentally taken into account in business decisions. 
this is a risk that should materially affect how they see their supply chains, their, their exposure to risk. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are also efforts underway, both Treasury Secretary Yellen and others have been talking about climate risk disclosure uh, in the marketplace more broadly. So what we're coming up against now is, I think, a very interesting dynamic where climate change is finally, finally being talked about as an economic and financial risk. Yes, it's a risk to future generations. It's a deep equity issue. Uh, it's affecting ecosystems. It's an environmental problem, a public health problem. And guess what? It's an economic problem. And so having metrics like this out there, having them be part of the decision-making frameworks and how people think about solutions, not just the problem, but the solutions and how they can be part of it uh, is crucial. Well, I, with, with that, I'm, I'm just going to invite you both just to, to, to end with a final takeaway, you know, just uh, anything that you think the audience should, should leave this conversation where we've covered really a lot of ground and we probably could have talked for another hour, but just, you know, anything that, that is a final takeaway for, for the audience. I guess what I would say is climate change is already here. It's already exacting a devastating toll on uh, the people, on people on our planet. And we have choices. Our choices are deeply consequential. So using every tool in our toolbox to act across the economy, to cut our emissions as quickly and deeply as possible, that's the imperative of the day. We do have choices and our choices will be very consequential for our children and grandchildren. I would just uh, say that specifically on uh, the social cost of greenhouse gases, um, any reasonable estimate of the social cost of greenhouse gases is significantly higher than the level of effort we are currently putting into as a society in terms of what we've been willing to spend to address it, um, significantly higher. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of complexities to this. But any social cost of carbon or other greenhouse gases, whether it's $50 per ton or $100 per ton or even $25 a ton, we are not taking that level of action right now. And so the economic benefits of addressing this uh, very, very, very substantially uh, exceed the cost of doing so. And so it warrants a much more significant policy action than we've taken to date. Well, thank you to your to you both. A uh, uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I, with that, I, I'm going to hand back to to Alex. Uh, but uh, just a fantastic conversation. Thanks, Justin. Well, thank you, Justin, and thank you again to all of you for joining us for the third climate conversations from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I want to thank Rachel and Richard for sharing your extensive expertise and a special thanks, Justin, for your thoughtful moderation. The conversation was recorded and should be available for viewing on this same webpage starting tomorrow. Um, and again, there should be a link above to join us for our next month's climate conversation, which you can access by going to solargeoengineering.eventbrite.com. At the event, we'll talk about the possible risks and benefits of solar geoengineering as a potential part of the toolkit we've discussed um, of responses to climate change. Again, that's solargeoengineering.eventbrite.com and the event will take place May 20th. I also invite you to join us for the April 26th to 28th Nobel Prize Summit, where you can join Nobel Prize laureates, scientists, policymakers, business leaders, and youth leaders to explore the question, what could be achieved in this decade to put the world on a path to a more sustainable, more prosperous future for all of humanity? We'll also share this information through our Climate at the National Academies newsletter, which you can also sign up for above. As a final reminder, to share your feedback on today's event or your ideas for future events, please see the survey link also above. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And again, thanks to Justin, Rachel, and Richard for sharing your background and expertise with us. Um, lastly, thank you to the climate communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. We're excited to continue this conversation through future events like this. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.